boat. Um, this is Damien Ferry from the Unshackled again. And uh, we're now doing a live interview here with uh, Clifford Jennings. And um, tell us a bit about yourself, Clifford. Sure. So um, I've been involved in the National Circles for about eight or so years now. I was um, a member of the Liberal Party. Eventually, I found that we're not the answer for nationalism or even conservatism for that matter in Australia. Um, so I left on to go to bigger and better things, and I uh, created Alt Right Australia. Um, along with organising street movements and most, most of the events and things, we also uh, have a weekly podcast we post that on our website, the Digos on the XYZ. It's weekly, it's called Comedy, a very funny one. Okay. Uh, Alt Right celebrities such as um, Craig Johnson here. Terrific, great episode. And uh, even local politicians like uh, Mark Lake, terrific guy. There we go. I'm not on the podcast, sadly, but um, there are plenty of other very, very good people who are on there. Excellent. All right, well, uh, tell us a bit uh, about what you thought of the event today. Obviously, we were all at the um, the pro Trump and anti Trump um, protests. Um, his inauguration was at 3 a.m. this morning, Australian time. And um, there was a lot happening, obviously, uh, a lot of yelling both sides and um, very interesting things, so uh, just tell us a bit about your thoughts about that. Yeah, sure, so, I mean, firstly, let's just say it's completely ridiculous that they're holding a protest against Trump in Australia. Um, I suppose the whole reason why we decided to um, have a counter protest is because we just wanted to highlight how ridiculous they are. It's just, there's no point to it. And of course, it gets to expose ourselves to um, to each other, to network. Um, really, nationalist um, organisations and groups should be working with each other rather than against each other for whatever autistic personality clash or ideological difference. People need to connect and network just like the does. Um, in terms of today, though, uh, we, were, we were horribly outnumbered, such as the usual fakes of um, nationalists in Australia. Um, it happens. The, the important thing, however, is that the truth is told. That, that is the big thing. Um, I do thank the police for making sure that uh, we, were, we were safe. Um, they kept the, the Antifa parts, the, the scum, well away. They kept us quite contained, uh, safe from what appears to be like Bishop's Union. Um, overall, I think it went fairly well. Again, no violence, crack. People were able to convey a message, people were able to be visible. No one acted up, and um, that's exactly what, why I want things to operate in the future. That's right, yeah. I mean, um, you were saying about us, um, of course, being um, outnumbered. Um, yeah. What do you think is um, a way to go forward in regards to maybe uh, bringing more people um, on your side of things uh, to boost numbers? What do you think is the best way to do so? Well, I don't think that we need to be outnumbered at all. I just think that the left have mastered um, networking just a lot whole lot better than the right. I think that there are a lot of um, right, right wing folk with various descriptions and ideologies around. It's just a matter of getting them to go to the events, know who to talk to, and go from there. Sadly, uh, the right does not appear to have a, uh, a George Soros, uh, like the left does. That's right. Um, it, it's quite ironic, really, that such a multi multi billionaire is funding cancer drugs, the one who wants to tear down the whole structure. Well, the kind of. Um I guess it plays into an agenda, a uh, globalist one, really, because, um, of course, it, uh, it is a really opposite. Uh, you wouldn't think a rich person would fund such a group, but um, the whole point of this is that um, groups such as Antifa and many others are actually creating chaos, which then, in turn, will um, give them the power to, for instance, want to bring in a police state or, um, or want to uh, put in you know, certain orders or certain laws to uh, strip freedoms away from us, for instance. Because um, this is what they do, they'll, they'll get certain people to, to play up and then they'll then, once they create the problem, then they'll provide the solution. And the solution is to further strip freedoms, provide us with laws, um, Marxist laws, of course. And I mean, um, another thing you mentioned that was quite interesting was um, with regards to, uh, of course, the uniting um, of the rights, um, is it a problem that um, there are so many... Uh, small groups on the right side and that there, there isn't really an effort um, perhaps for people to join and to, to be united, perhaps due to egos and, and certain things like that. Probably the best term to use here is that everybody wants to be pure. Now, I don't mean that in the actual you know, sense, 
the problem. If so many, so many of these groups, but a lot of them just want to be the leader. Now, I just happen to organize a lot of things for my own, for my own group. I, if there was someone better than me who comes along and would do better, great. Let them do the job. All I care about is protecting our country and our people. That's right. I mean, um, it's, it, is, it is a case I've even noticed that um, there, there is a lot of people. Um, I mean, you can. Not, not even just on the street movement, which is obviously so many groups, but obviously um, just looking at the political side of things, uh, you've got so many political parties on the right side that are all splitting votes. Um, you know, 2% here, 1% there, and they're all splitting them up, whereas on the left you've only got one solid Greens party, uh, for example. I mean, you do have really, really tiny sort of left parties, but they're so minute that they're, done, they're, they're, they're insignificant. Um, is, there, is there a way... Possibly that, um, I mean, obviously a, an ego factor of being the leader is, is the, the key sort of play um, on the right. But, um, I mean, obviously it comes to a point where people are going to have to start to um, think, well, we gave it our best shot, but at the end of the day, if we really want what's best for our country, um, we all have the same values, more or less. So we might as well uh, join together and, um, and pursue, and then you'll get those values in the parliament by getting people elected. Um, we've got about probably close to a dozen minor right-wing parties that I can even think of off the bat. I mean, is there a way of um, any maybe mergers taking in place? Well, I, I have heard that there is talk of mergers with one or two political parties, devouring the others, but in a, I suppose, a friendly way. Um, even if people want to remain separate and disparate, you should be at least reaching out to your fellow nationalists and saying, what we believe in, what do you believe in? Should we agree on this, right? You don't know that? Sure, let's sort that out when we secure our common goals first. I mean, it is, um, it is the case that when you do have a look at all these minor parties, if there is any disagreements on issues, it's so minute that it's, um, it's very silly that there is even a second party um, representing the same thing. Um, and I mean, um, on the right also, like we've said, in the leadership role, it does seem to be the case that uh, the parties do centralise or make focus on a particular leader rather than the actual values of the, the party itself. It seems to be um, very uh, centred, very much like a personality of the leader. And uh, I think that really does destroy things because I think uh, normal Australians just want to support a party for its values rather than its leader in itself. Um, well, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. The two major parties in Australia don't, don't really... They're not really that different. There are some obvious things that are a little bit different. Um, obviously, border control, although that's now become similar. Yeah, oh, yeah. wait, carbon tax slash ETS, that's become quite similar now. Um, low tax, high tax, again, taxes aren't really going down that much now, even with two Liberal governments, so New South Wales and Federal. And of course, um, our, uh, our uh, former Premier, or almost former Premier, Mike Baird. Of course, represents the Liberal Party, the, the Small Business Party. Has also, uh, of course, introduced the lockout rules uh, and uh, found on Greyhound Racing. Now, I couldn't give a rat to that Greyhound Racing, but it's the principle that I do. But of course, it, that's a lot of business effect. Uh, I think it's quite clearly the wrong. And it seems almost that um, for a party, uh, it's supposed to be a conservative party, to be pushing on a Greens issue. That's, uh, I mean, even when you get someone like the Labor Party coming out and, and going against it, that really sort of says there must have been something hidden behind the scenes we're not aware of. I mean, it just, uh, it just seems like it smells funny to me when it, with the breakout issue on it. So, I mean, um, yeah, very odd, very, very weird. Um, it wasn't an issue that was in the public, all of a sudden it just become an issue overnight, and that, that's very strange. I mean, um, obviously we had Mike Baird resigning as well, uh, just recently. Now, um, it seems clear that um, come Tuesday when they select their leader, that um, blood is very jiggly and may be in the, in the box seat really to get the job. Now, I mean, blood is it's even... Uh, Gladys is even uh, more left-wing than Baird is, and Baird is sort of considered more or less like a centrist at the very sort of least of the Liberal Party, and Gladys is pretty far left of the party, so I mean, um, the Liberals tend to do better with Conservative leaders, I've found. Um, you can always point to Turnbull and Abbott, of course, with their election results. So, what do you think that the Liberal Party, what's a warning to them 
with regards to selecting your leader? What do you think, uh, what direction do you think they should, they should be taking? That really is a bit of a hard one. The, the, the problem with the, the Liberal Party is that they are officially in denial that such a thing as that exists. I mean, that speaks from the Labor Party, they're, they're regimented to join left, right, or whatever. Um, the Liberal Party, it's all much more murky. Everything is about establishment control. Um, in terms of how to better select a leader, I would fully support plebiscites, full uh, and open plebiscites, rather than just pre-selection of delegates, I think that's the wrong way to go. Um, if, if you open it up to the people of the party, the, the grassroots members, I think we'll solve that. If you get grassroots members, uh, which is uh, do, you, do you support uh, Tony Abbott's plan, which was to uh, open pre-selection to the actual uh, the membership? I think it should be to the membership, uh, not to the general public. I think you need to join the political party to have a say in sort of controlling things and it's uh, the, the Turnbull sort of faction um, that's in control of the New South Wales uh, Liberals, which is a left faction, and um, unfortunately Conservatives are having more and more of a hard time getting the voice in. Uh, and the, the funny thing is, I mean, the, the base is largely more Conservative than it is Liberal of the Liberal Party and support base, but they don't want to listen to them, they, they have their own opinion. Well, the Liberals, I mean, the Liberal Conservatives have been consistently betrayed by those who proclaim to be conservatives. Um, I, I want to you know, you know, that there is a certain member in the northwest of Sydney um, who has, sorry, who was considered to be conservative, a program day, very well known uh, conservative, uh, MLC, yeah. still sitting on that, which is great. Um, genuinely conservative country. A lot of branches from the left, which is great. Formed his own alignment created his own faction and made an alliance for them. So it's just consistent betrayal. Very sad. Um, again, you're not going to get rid of that for that um, Certainly, um, stacking is always going to be a factor because in Australia, you are all cut. You can't cut a at least. Um, but the side of the open system, more grassroots members have the same. Is it a case that, um, in general, that um, we're seeing more and more politicians uh, acting on self-interest rather than a uh, than actually standing by principles or values? Of course, it's all about self-interest. There's a plague of career politicians, and I mean, um, the the thing with that is that um, they go in there basically on the intent to do nothing. Um, I mean, we need people there that represent those values. I mean, is there any? Uh, political parties at this stage that you would consider um, well, not necessarily that you would back, but ones that you think represent um, the, the, the old-fashioned kind of values that um, that you think will make this country uh, a lot more prosperous? No. Really, there are elements from multiple party parties that make sense, but there is no, there is currently no one party that would make Australia great. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, that, that's exactly right. I mean, like, I've seen uh, many uh, many uh, parties um, that have come by on the right, and um, like we've been saying, that there is uh, good things in between them, but not a perfection kind of. Uh, I mean, even with One Nation, I mean, I think lately they've been a big lead because with One Nation, um, I, I thought they started off well. I thought, you know, both Pauline, Malcolm Roberts, everyone was going really good in presenting their cases, really on the issues. But then lately, we've seen it start to fall apart. We've seen uh, Malcolm Roberts uh, seem like he's, um, he's going up the Zionist interests rather than people's interests. That was very strange. Which is very strange very because, strange. I mean, they're not people that would normally be One Nation voters. It's just minorities sort of pandering, you know. And um, not only that, uh, but there is a second issue in place that um, Pauline Hanson um, has uh, James Ashby involved and um, that they sacked um, Shandrew Lynch. Um, a candidate for uh, speaking out on um, on gay issues and the, the certain uh, particular post she put on Facebook was uh, in, regards, in regards to uh, uh, pedophile um, pedophile abuse of children and um, 
because um, she didn't take it down, they, they turned it down as a candidate. I mean, um, that seems very odd, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, especially, I mean, this is something that um, not only many um, Australians would have a concern over, but um, for, a, for a right-wing party to, um, to banish a candidate for such an issue, um, it's kind of like a, um, for instance, in comparison, a green uh, taking action against um, someone that's uh, is advocating environmentalism. It doesn't really make much sense. Uh, I do want to address one thing, though. Um, there is a lot of confusion out there um, as to what the alt-right is. I would like to I suppose, go after that directly. The alt-right, the, the term itself was coined by, I suppose, a combination of Paul Goffrey and Richard Spencer. Um, it comes down to, really, a belief in ethnic interest. It believes in, as well as it believes in radical traditionalism. And that it primarily believes in a love of your own, a love of protecting and preserving your own. Obviously, moving forward into the future is what you can, but without discarding the past, without losing your, your identity. Um, that is where I think conservatism should have been, but hence the term of right having evolved. The reaction to the, the sales of conservatism, because conservatism these days is more about the Conservatism, sorry, the conservative, conserving of the status quo, yes. which is far from ideal. We do not live in a conservative society, right? Now. There are elements, there are pockets of conservative, conservative still around, but um, hard to know. It's, it's not an order that is sustainable or is one worth protecting. I've actually, um, I'll, add, I'll add more to that because um, I've uh, found a lot of fascination with the other right movement because. Um, I think that it really uh, represents uh, a silent majority mindset that um, that most Australians would agree with. Because when you think of the alt right, it really uh, blends in a lot of uh, what you would call old school labour values mixed in with um, the more sort of um, uh, I guess nationalistic kind of liberal values. It really is a mixture, and it strikes the right mixture because I mean, like you were saying. But like Clifford was saying, the problem is with conservatism at the moment, and I would call myself conservative, but a, a proper conservative, is um, that they are neocon, you see? And, um, and the problem with that is that, like you said, they represent status quo. And um, the left have always represented status quo. And within the last couple of decades, there has been moves to, um, for conservatives to switch and to start to follow status quo as well. And I think that the old right really is um, trying to bring conservatism to where it used to be back where it should have been. Where it should have been. Many, many years ago, it used to be that way. It used to be about family values, uh, nationalistic pride in one, one's culture, oneself. It used to be uh, economically um, slightly more protectionist and not so um, um, in, in a position where you want to sell your ass if you had to, sell your country and everything, you know. And that's where a lot of conservatism these days is a problem with because they just want to sell everything. Everything is for a price, you know? Well, let's explore that for a second. I mean, really, if you, if you go back to um, go back to Menzies himself, he is what conservative should have been. He was a very, very good conservative. He had elements of protectionism with his economic beliefs, certainly. Um, he opened uh, Australia's trade borders, to, you know, especially to Japan. And Although, of course, that um, you know, the history of it, there was pressure to do that by his trade and finance business. Um, that was, wasn't something he was willing to do before this, but he contributed to the earnings as I believe he can. Um, but, uh, yeah, obviously, very pro monarchy, very pro British Empire. It's terrific to hold on to that. That's one of the cornerstones of the Australian settlement. And of course, um, we can definitely believe in family values, and it's lovely family. Yeah. 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 This is where it should have been, just the liberal leadership has paid ever since. I mean, I look at Tony Abbott with a great degree of sadness. I mean, I think he, I mean, he's come up, he's, he's been brought up in the right positions. He's from a good family. He went through the seminary, he went through his road stolen. It's terrific. Um, all of that's great. He had great beliefs, but he didn't act on it. He didn't reward his friends. He put his enemies in positions of power. Tony Abbott's problem was he did not know how to play the game. And 
game played him. I think. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think Tony Abbott was the closest to Menzies that we ever get. For a that, while. That we, for, for a while, yes. I mean, um, he was a lot better than Howard anyway. I mean, um, and Howard is considered a conservative hero. I think Abbott is, you know, at a different degree. But um, I think um, Clifford makes a good point that um, I think he was too good of a guy that um, he was too loyal to people he shouldn't have been to. Um, they were letting him down. But, um, I mean, in the end, again, like, um, for someone to um, not um, fire people that were not doing the right job out of loyalty, I mean, that shows how good of a person he was. Obviously, it did really kill him in the end, you know. But, um, of course, he had the media against him badly because he was doing the right moves. And in two years, he achieved a lot. He, um, he'd done a lot of things. He uh, promised that he would get rid of the carbon tax, mining tax. He did it. He, he did promise to stop the boats, and he did that. You know, so he, he did do a lot of good things, um, and he had the right values as well. This made very silly promises. I will not cut funding to the ABC. I will not review spending to the North. I will um, remove Section 18C of the racial discrimination. And of course, us wanting to remove 18C of the racial discrimination act is not so that. Um, Holocaust deniers and not that the really far out people can have a say on that, but rather so that we can also express ourselves in a more litigiously safe manner. When you look at those uh, small streams from QUT, you're going to find hundreds of thousands of dollars. I want to find those and go sue for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but daring to use an Aboriginal IT lab, which itself is a very bizarre concept to me. That's right, I mean, um, yeah. Um, really. yeah, that's right. I mean, um, <laughs> it, it seems if you're a um, if you're a white straight male, you're you're pretty much on the on the hit list these days. But um, yeah, it's uh, these safe spaces and everything. It's just really all gone haywire and um, just uh, degeneracy in, in public. I mean, um, I actually um, was telling Clifford before at the event that um, we we saw a couple of. Uh, children being involved with placards um, that were against Trump, and we also seen a couple of women uh, topless, of all things. And I mean, this is the kind of thing, I mean, is, is this really liberating uh, females? I mean, it's it's really doing the opposite of what, to what they actually are, are advocating, you know what I mean? Like, so... Are women happy? Yeah. Are, are they happy trying to get as drunk as men? Are they happy to have the ability to go and die in the front lines? Are they happy having a, an empty, I suppose, an empty romantic lifestyle? Are they happy having multiple sexual partners without any emotional fulfillment? That's right. Personally, I think it's just very tragic, very sad. Um, and this isn't me trying to exert misogynistic control over women, but I just think that women can do better for themselves. I mean, like, um, honestly, when you go back in time, to a it all started in the 60s when everything went down. I mean, yeah, some of that's right. I mean, and all of the, the claims that back in the 1950s women were, you know, somehow subjected to this and that, really they were respected so highly back then in those days. I mean, they were. I mean, if you look at your grandparents, anybody look at your grandparents and see how they are two in a couple. They grew up in those times, right? See how they intertwined together. They have traditional gender roles. Everything was done traditionally, but is the woman put down or no, definitely not. They held with such a high respect um, that today you see women and they're just treated like garbage because of this whole liberation. And it's not just that they're treated like garbage, they treat themselves like that. That's right. I and mean, you look at that, um, that Nicki Minaj, right? And she's got this song, uh, I can't remember the name, but she basically says, no, no, you're a stupid hoe. You're a stupid hoe, and it makes these, these beeping sounds from pretty much the, the whole song. Those are the lyrics, and she's just, you know, throwing her tits everywhere, her asses everywhere too. It's just, it, it, it's self, I suppose, self identification. It's self, it, it's degenerating your own identity. That's right. I mean, it, it really affects the culture. It really affects the youth. Exactly. And, and it's and it, like what we've seen, it only goes a couple of generations and it really takes place. I mean, now we're seeing divorces, 50% divorce, right? You know, I mean, like that, yeah. you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, like um, families that are broken up, children that are suffering over it, you know? And um, it, 
it's just proof that when you go through these kind of experiences, that back how they used to be, that everything ran harmonious, everything was better as a community, and things worked. Why try and change things that worked? I mean, it's obviously an agenda because when you destroy the family, that's how you get in there, and then you can also, you know, tweak things along that line. I mean, um, but I mean, we're seeing immigration obviously becoming an issue. Melbourne, you know, just the other day, the media doesn't want to call it a terrorist attack. Well, you know, I mean, what do you think? Could, could be anything. Going back to that point you're making before about um, the family, what is it? When the Bolsheviks sent over their agents, um, well, it's the Soviets, I should say, sent, sent over their agents to the West, they identified that there were a few key things that they needed to destroy. Family, uh, they needed to destroy identity, and they needed to destroy religion, and of course Christianity. Now, um, sadly, I'm faithless myself, but um, I would call myself somewhat of a the European spirit, spirit. Uh, I take many tenets of Christianity in my church. I think the wants also be uh, to convert to this guy uh, from the pagan things. Uh, a lot of Christians don't like that, but they, you know, they probably think the same thing, guys. Come on. Um, but these days, the faith was on the rise. Marriages, as we've covered before, are uh, breaking up. Women, especially white women, are having less children. A very sad and tragic event. The only communities that are in fact growing are immigrant communities. It seems really that the ethnic people of, um, of Europe and the Anglo Saxon Celtic community of Australia are disappearing. And I think that that lack of identity will eventually destroy the West. Um, I think. Um when it comes to the amount of, uh, I think I, I totally agree, and I, I think it boils down to a few points. Although I might be deemed to get radical by saying this, but um, I think contraception is um, something that uh, changed things in the 60s. Um, I think um, that's the whole uh, liberation movement. Um, obviously, um, more people choosing to, to get into careers, and uh, likewise, I think there, there, there's so many factors involved. Obviously, and um, like, like we said, I mean. It is an issue because um, there there is going to be a stage that if I actually saw a good meme about this actually I'll raise it. It said uh, grandparents, ten kids. It said it said you know uh, a one of ten. The grandpa the um, great grandparents ten kids. The grandparents with six kids. Your parents two kids, and then people our age now an abortion and a dog. It really, it really is true, you know, I mean, it, it, it's so sad because, I mean, it, it's such a great experience to go uh, through life to have children and for people to give it up because they want the, the, the celebrity lifestyle, you know, which doesn't, it's all materialistic and it doesn't actually give them um, what they need in life to grow as a person. It's not just an experience, it's necessary. We don't have babies. We, we don't. That's right. We're, we're no longer around. Yeah. Look at what's happened to Japan. I mean, I, I do praise Japan for preserving their, their ethnic identity. I mean, their, their national cohesion was so obviously strong in the face of those horrible um, 2011 tsunamis. They, the rich, the poor, the Yakuza, everybody contributed to you know, finding survivors and rebuilding that country. Look then at Hurricane Katrina, very mixed identity. Uh, uh, you know, they lose it, they break, it's not trusting each other, there was murder, it was horrible. Um, there should be a strong sense of identity that really needs to be preserved. That's really the heart of what we are fighting about. That's right. We, we believe in identity, we believe in identity, we must love your love. Yeah, that's right, and I mean, um, if you continue to uh, not have uh, children and continue to, to go step away from that and like you said um, other communities have more children then eventually your values that you hold uh, so uh, so dear to you are going to go because they, the country will change with uh, the public that are here so I mean that's uh, something that will happen and if you want to preserve your uh, particular values then the best thing to do is to then pass your values on to other, other children. Have children. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> you know, it's always a good goal to, you know, I mean, but it, but it is it is such a great experience. I only have uh, the one daughter at the moment, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm planning to have a big family because 
you know, it's just it's, it's something to experience and, and to be able to pass your values on to other people and to teach them. It's just, you know, to me, people that really want to uh, live in this um, this modern kind of lifestyle, this just very selfish kind of lifestyle. Yeah, yeah it really is. Um, degeneracy, really. You know? <laughs> but um, there, there is another issue, actually, I'll bring up. We saw um, homeless people um, over on the side of Martin Place today. Yeah. Now, um, a lot of these uh, leftist communities or people um, are wanting immigrants to come in, but they're not willing to actually help the ones that are here first um, to have carry start at home, but they're willing to give immigrants the world by coming over here and giving them things. So, I mean, is, is that an issue, obviously, that um, these so-called uh, charitable people aren't really um, charitable at all because there's still people on the side of the street that they were not how many companies that do you really see down the soup kitchen? There is a fantastic organization called Just Enough Mate. They have a soup kitchen, they don't like that term, but it's what it is, which operates uh, sort of behind St. Mary's Cathedral uh, on some weeknights. Strongly recommend getting involved in part of that. It generally takes in a lot of uh, school kids to try and help uh, grow a sense of community and identity, taking care of the homeless. Um, I, I think one thing that people assume, however, is that um, the homeless are there because they have no, uh, they have no money because they're lazy or they, that they do something work. Well, not always the case. In fact, a lot of the time the homeless are there because they can't cope. It's like they have mental health issues. And that's not something that we need to attack them for or just go off and get them over. No, it's sad that we need, these people need our help. I mean, they, they are okay. There, there is obviously two sort of types of homeless. There is the ones that want to um, that want to do something for themselves, and ones that don't. Obviously, yeah. you know, the ones that do want um, to to be able to do it and just don't have the utilities or the resources to do so, they're the ones that we have to look after. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think um, another issue is that um, when um, a, a big amount of immigration comes in, it does two things. Um, firstly, it um, it floods the welfare system, which costs us money. And the second thing that it does is that it um, it puts more people in line for jobs when there's already so many unemployment people at the moment as is. So you've got all these people that could potentially be getting a job, but then they've got more competition now because of all these other people coming in. So until you get a, an unemployment rate that is basically close to zilch, that you have everybody that's you know, got a job and that's, you know, doing well for themselves, you can't really be in a position to accept more people because it really is a detriment to your country. So, yeah, it, it really it really is a situation. I mean, um, we've, we've had uh, a, a good time today because we've really um, seen two sides of an argument. We've got a lot of video footage and, um, you know, it, it's a very big difference. You know, there's, there's obviously a side a big population um, of people that don't accept democracy. I mean, you never, when Obama got elected, when any other lefty leader got elected, you never had conservatives out in streets protesting. Because, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it, it is democracy. You know? I mean, they might have got the wrong choice, but they still make that choice. It's not just that, but it's also because generally conservatives have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all like conservatives have jobs, they that's have right. families, they have responsibilities. Right. Right. Well, the leftists are the ones who enjoy those bohemian lifestyles, the ones who are, I suppose, paid by the George Soros of this world to professionally protest. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, that, if you notice actually at a lot of protests, um, when I first went. That's not a job. <laughs> when we got there at one o'clock, it was absolutely packed. I, I yes. could have counted, you know, 500 to even more, you know, it was massive. Now, about half an hour after that, about 1.30, the crowd started to thin down and there was only a little bit of a crowd that would have maybe reduced to maybe 100 people, maybe 200 if that, but more than half of the people left. Normally that happens when people's uh, time is up in the, when it comes to the renter crowds. You know, so it's, it's just sad that these people have to actually pay just to make a presence, you know. They have to pay people to make it look like that they're somebody. And, of course, the news, the mainstream fake news is going to report it tonight. They're not going to report our case, but you'll have to look at uh, other sources. Uh, the Dingoes, Unshackled, XYZ, uh, Old Con News. Well, 
to get a different view, to get a bit of a different opinion, because if you're listening to ABC, 9, 7, it doesn't matter, it's all the same people running the show there, it's, it's all the same agenda. So that, that's that's the problem there. I urge, I urge anyone listening to this, look beyond the Google place, look beyond the mainstream media, look at other sources, look at multiple sources. Everyone spends some time in a train or just doing whatever, chilling out. It doesn't take long to read a couple of articles from a few different sources. You just go to Google News. You get all the different articles on a particular issue that you've ever watched. Just challenge yourself. Read it. Read. Help. Read the Guardian. See what the left are going to say about yeah. themselves. Because when you get different views, then you can analyze it and then say, okay, well, this makes a little bit more sense. But if you're only getting one particular view, then that just in someone's mind becomes the norm and there is no other sort of, uh, it's like, oh, that's reality because, you know, everybody's saying the same thing. But, I mean, it's just like, for instance, the, um, the, the Melbourne attack, um, everyone was trying to play down that. On the Australian Christian lobby buildings, when that, um, those, um, the truck with the, the cylinders exploded. Now, I mean, we don't even know who that person is. They still haven't told us. Who is this guy? I mean, so there's obviously, you know, they're not, we're not getting the full story. And this is why other sources then need to provide this other um, evidence, you know. It was clearly the same Japanese who was also on drugs and mentally drained. That is clearly the case. Actually, sorry, no, it's not like Japanese, Eskimos. The Eskimos. They come to Australia in droves and they're here to take them. Take your life. That's that's all there are. There could not be any other group, particularly not any group in the Middle East. I mean, what? <laughs> Eskimos. I mean, like, it's not it's not the fact. I mean, that the, the fact is we don't know. You know, I mean, like, and, and that, that's yeah, a, that's a really yeah, that's a really sad point that we're not actually being told this. You know, I mean, for instance, we had to go on Facebook and look up um, the the bloke from Melbourne, uh, this uh, Demetrios. Um, whatever he said, Gagasulas or whatever it was, and Gagasulas it was, and uh, we had to look at all these posts to get a bit of an idea of the character of who he was. Now, I mean, obviously a, a nutcase, but I mean, the the media sort of straight to the point, oh, you know, don't worry people, you know, nothing to fear, it's all good, you know. I mean, they really played it down, you know. I mean, it, this, this is not something normal that someone does burnouts and then goes runs over a few people. This is not something that, you know, it's not like he just, you know, went out at night and, you know, was angry at a particular person and stabbed them. This was like in public, in public, in broad daylight, and, and just killed random people, even a baby, you know. I mean, I really... <laughs> yeah, definitely, you know. And I mean... We, we, we obviously uh, need to speak up about these things because nobody else will. But ter terror attacks are one thing, but when you have constant criminal problems in Melbourne due to African communities, and, and I will say that it's explicit, it, it is, the, the crime problem is coming from largely Sudanese refugee communities that we import into Melbourne. It's, it's indisputable. Look at the food to make that stand. Ask anyone in Hackney. All the time, right. the police will find them. The police do tend to find them, but they get them counselling and let them go. So look, I, I love the police. We have to respect the police, but they are not being given the powers that they need to, I suppose, deal with the apex threat. I mean, all must be done. Um, do you think that um, possibly uh, I'll be called a bit of a radical by saying this, but? Uh, and many people have a bit of sympathy for uh, what Duterte is doing over in the Philippines. Of course, you don't have to go maybe possibly to the, to the extreme, but do you think having more discipline and more harsh sort of uh, uh, way of dealing with things is the way to go? Because obviously, obviously it needs to be done. And then there is a lot of people looking at that kind of system and saying, well, at the end of the day, uh, people are getting killed, but more people, more innocent people will get killed if uh, these particular criminals are there doing their... their they're dealing, you know. We've like, already practiced that in Australia. We were, we are, we were considered vir virtually the fourth right for our border policies, for turning back boats, pushing them back to Indonesia, or worst case scenario, having them in offshore processing centres. That was considered to be like concentration camps and, and exile. It was ridiculous, but did it save lives? Yes. 
and that is what we need. And maybe we don't need to go shooting refugees or but like deter they shoot. Yeah, yeah. Drug drug addicts and drug dealers and anyone near it drug anything. That's um certainly fear of the law. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. And in Australia, people generally don't fear the law. Certainly some of the new immigrant communities do not. That's right. I mean, um, and especially if you're a leftist, then you, you think you're above the law because, I mean, there's a lot of groups involved in violent activities that get away with anything. I mean, um, I uh, personally, uh, I have a mate and um, he got attacked by uh, Antifa and um, he got stabbed and bashed uh, over the head with golf clubs. Now, I mean, um, he's been to court over the past year with them and these Antifa members um, got let off the hook all because that there was some sort of, um, well, like, I, I, I have to say that there's something smelly about it because um, the certain paperwork wasn't handed in on time or whatever the case was. But what we're getting is that people are feeling, especially our youth, are feeling like they can get away with anything. And this didn't happen in our parents' time. There was more discipline in the community, there was less crime. People could leave their doors open at the front door. They, you know, but now people are, you know, obviously with these gangs coming in, more activity. I mean, people are scared for their lives now. Well, if you're from Syria, the penalties for stealing or raping or murder or beating someone are quite severe. You, you would probably be expected to not only be thrown in jail, but they beat the shit out of you in the process. Um, we do here, we cancel them and we put them in minimum security, generally speaking, generally speaking. Like, Peter Duffin wants to deport APEC, APEC state members, and I think that's terrific. They've abused the trust that we shouldn't have given them in the first place, to be frank. Um, they've got to go back to the words of Trump. That's right. I mean, uh, it worked well before, and um, unfortunately we've got the wrong people leading the way. I mean, you've got Daniel Andrews in power in Victoria. I mean, that's the closest to a communist system that I've ever seen. Here we go. I mean, it really is a worry. I mean, all the, the policies, especially when it's put to our youth, because, I mean, they don't know any better. I mean, parents are sending them to school thinking they're learning maths, English, reading, writing, and then they're coming home and learning about, oh, how, how, how did the child fantasise about being a, a, a 12-year-old in love with a 16-year-old of the same gender, or... You know, how, how to search up porn on the internet or, or about sex toys or, or fetish clubs. I mean, this is... And homeschooling is on the rise. And I'm, I'm telling you now, if their schools don't get their act together, then I think there's no really much of an alternative out there because it really is getting to a stage where our kids are at risk here. They really are to this agenda. It's, um, it's scary. And I mean, when you have politicians be able to go and do these things... And, um, and then when you get conservatives that have to sort of, you know, due to the, the uh, being scared of media harassment or whatever, really have to tiptoe along things and trying to do things that aren't too radical. But then these guys are doing extremities, obviously extremities, you know. I mean, and this is what Abbott had as a situation. I mean, there were so many things he wanted to do and he felt, oh, you know, I really want to do this, but I can't because I'm going to face a backlash. Now... I mean, we, Trump is a perfect example of someone that had values and regardless of what he thought people would think about him, he went with him and I think a lot of people respected that because he said, you know what, if this guy believes in what he's doing and he's not pandering to anybody, then we're going to get on board with that because he, he knows that this is the right thing for the country, you know, and I mean, people respect that. I mean, a lot of people always used to bag out Howard, oh, you know, I remember growing up as a kid, everybody hated him. Johnny Howard, everyone hated him, right? But at the end of the day, he kept winning in the elections. I mean, does that tell you that a lot of the media is just fake, you know? I mean, about this hate that certain politicians have. Because people at the end of the day have respect for particular politicians with principles, regardless of what is fashionable, you know? And, uh, I mean, do you think at the moment um, that there is any sort of politicians, um, regardless of parties, that sort of stand out as uh, principled people that would be good at uh, leading or, or being in a position where they could um, have an influence on making society better again? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, Cory Bernardi. Yeah. Cory Bernardi pretty is pretty much yeah. the key name that comes to mind. Whether or not he stays in the Liberal Party is another question. Or makes his own thing. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, I don't. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, he, he really is uh, this year. He 
Robinson's going to be in the sort of frame set, well, I've got to do something soon if I am going to do it. So, I mean, a lot of people are sort of annoyed because they're thinking, well, is it going to happen? Isn't it going to happen? But I think there is um, a few good people. I mean, there's uh, Bernardi, there's Christensen. Christensen, I've a lot of respect for. He's really outspoken. Uh, Abetz, Andrews, uh, Kevin Andrews, um, and several others, um, you know, regardless of party, that are principled people and that will fight, you know. And um, I think these are the kind of people that we need. And unfortunately, there is um, many people that are infiltrating the parties that these good principled people become a minority and they don't have much of a voice. So if that means creating another party or um, to somehow re-establish... Um, the main party that they're in, then something really has to happen because we're at uh, a crossroads at the moment, really. So hopefully, uh, hopefully someone can uh, make Australia great again. And I mean, I wouldn't uh, take things. Uh, I would take everything with a pinch of salt, really, regardless of the party. So you know, if, even if one nation comes out and says what they say, still make sure that you really look at everything that's said because they're not perfect. Uh, they they are providing good ideas, but um, sometimes it is what people don't say rather than what they do say that is a problem because there's a lot of things that they still have to talk about that they haven't. Um, so I, I think, you know, they've made a start, but if they keep going down the track that they are recently, um, with Ashby on the helm, I think that they're going to just be another party down to rule. I mean, it really is. I mean, people have to be principled and they don't have to give in to political correctness. Um, so, uh, Trump, Trump did it. No, exactly right. And everybody was deemed to be against him, but he won areas. I mean, this is another thing. I mean, when you have someone on the right that defeats the whole narrative of the right being for the rich, I mean, he won a lot of working class blue, blue states, you know. Rust Belt, Wisconsin. He was very close to even winning Minnesota. One percent is incredible. And, and that was not one since Nixon in 1972. I mean, I've done articles on this, and it's fascinating. And I mean, you know, all those people that, you know, bagged him, Romney and McCain, those guys couldn't do it. They couldn't beat a Democrat. And it took someone that is deemed, you know, radical, so to speak, like Trump, to actually do the job. Because when you when you are in the right wing and you are a, um, a moderate, people see you as not very different to the left. And because of that, they don't vote for you. You have to have that clear stance. So when you say, oh... You have to come to the centre to, to be able to win an election. That's false, because everyone on the right that's won an election has been on the conservative right, like Abbott, landslides, you know? I mean, Howard always won in a great deal of numbers as well. So, I mean, but then when you get moderates, Turnbull, you know, reduced to a one-seat major majority, one seat, you know? I mean, and then other leaders in the past, you know? Um, I mean, Fraser was a failure. Um, you had other leaders like... Um, Nelson and Downer and, and Houston, they were all failures. I mean, only the Conservatives really were the ones that... Um, and, I mean, if Abbott, if Abbott really done, did stick to his um, to, to what he believed in and didn't have other people sort of control his thoughts, then I think he could have been a, a, another Howard and, and ruled for 10 years because he really had the capabilities to do so. He was seen as such a strong leader and he showed in the election results. It was very sad. Yeah. I mean, when... When I seen Turn Turnbull beat him at that um, at that uh, victory backstabbing, uh, I felt like crying. And the reason why is because I knew our, our nation was just gone. I mean, to have someone like Turnbull lead the party as prime minister, it, it brought me to tears because I just knew then that our country's dead now. I mean, we, we have no no conservative now. I mean, we've had we had hope, and now we just don't. You know, I mean, Turnbull is an expander. You know, I mean, the guy, the guy is running. I mean, how how is he in touch with anybody? I mean, Abbott was somebody. He went to Western Sydney, and they loved him. I mean, he won six out of eight seats in Western Sydney. John Howard won only four. Turnbull won only two. You know, I mean, he connected. And I mean, one guy said it right. Turnbull went over to Penrith, and and a guy said, you know what? As soon as I seen him with his couplings, I knew I couldn't vote for him. You know, I mean, it's, it's just in another world, you know. I mean, he might love to talk about climate change and, and you know, uh, refugees and all that with his inner, inner city elite over in his mansion, but it doesn't resonate to the majority of the Australian public. So, I mean, 
we really need somebody that will have conservative social values, will have uh, pride installed in cultural identity, will economically take care of Australia and not sell us out. I mean, uh, and will look after working class and middle class people, not only the rich, not only the elitists. This is all of the, the factors, all of the things that we need, that someone has to step up and say, you know what, I can be that person. And it's not about ego. At the end of the day, if Jim down the road can do the job, let's get him on board. You know, it doesn't really matter. Even Pauline Hanson actually at least said, well, you know what? If Corey Bernardi could come and do a better job than me, I'll put him as leader. I mean, at least that's showing a little bit of uh, unity and it's not showing an egotistical attitude because I'm telling you now, there's so many leaders in there and they'll say, you know what? I want to call it next. I'm going to tomorrow make a Damien Ferry Conservative Party. Just for the sake of my name being the, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous, you know. I mean, there's 12, there's about at least 10 to 12 parties that are are big enough to get, you know, a decent amount of votes. Now, if you put all those votes together, it would smash the Greens, absolutely. I mean, this would come to maybe 15 plus percent. And I mean, then when you get the Conservative um, people that vote for the Liberal and National Party involved, that's a new majority right there. All of that, together. I mean, people really need to start, you know, not dividing us, and start working together because we've got the same goals in mind. Uh, but um, we do have another rally uh, coming up uh, in a week's time uh, in Sydney, and that's uh, the Reclaim Australia rally. Uh, we'll be uh, going to it. Oh, I'll ask the boss. <laughs> It should be interesting anyway. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can um, we can go and get some more footage. And um, obviously, it's going to be a bigger crowd. I've heard that there was going to be uh, about 400 people turning up. That's what I've heard. Um, we had Party for Freedom um, uh, come today, and uh, they informed me that it's going to be pretty big, uh, which means that there's going to be even double on the other side of things as well, like they normally is. So this, it's going to be pretty big, and you know, hopefully the police will be able to contain it because they were able to do it today. But um, with such a crowd like that, I'm just hoping nothing goes out of control because we like peaceful, um, you know, freedom of speech, putting our voices out there, and um, that's the only way to do it, really. You know, if we can um, change one person's mind, it's victory. You know, because we're actually trying to reach out to people and say. Hey, did you know about this? Oh, no, I didn't, you know. The, the news has never talked about that, you know. So it's it's so important. So I, I urge people to get to that rally. And I urge people to look at all the video clips that um, that we on The Unshackled put up, uh, Party for Freedom, that also Clifford puts up um, about what happened today. And um, it should be great because we really need to uh, get people involved. And um, it was great to, to talk to